Today we have one of the most important lessons that I feel God has ever allowed me to see. My prayer is that as we study these truths, that that it would in, invoke us all to go deeper in the Word of God, to realize that His Word is a reality, His truths are real, that His eternal kingdom is real, and that we all have to make sure to dil diligently search and stick to the plan that He has ordained for us to live in. So bear with me uh, today as we as we focus on the lesson, the golden calf, one of the most revelatory and relevant lessons and topics God has ever allowed me to see and I believe to for him to show me this that is that I must make it known to others for though for those that receive it they can take it you can take it or leave it for how you want for how you want it but I must present this uh, out so that all can take assess review come to whatever conclusion that the Holy Spirit allows you to come into we we have to allow our hearts to be open. We have to be diligent and diligent in our search for God's will for our life. So as we expound on this true truth, the golden calf. Hopefully God will, 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 will just show you what he wants each and each individual to know. We are, we are in days we are drawn down to the close of all it, uh, of this this earth age where, where the next earth age where Christ returns and then there's the new Jerusalem and, and but not to go too deep into those things but we but we are now at a point in time where God is about to shake his church he's about to he's about to distinguish between the elect and the not so elect those that are truly dedicated to him and those that are not that this Old Testament has many truths, a picture book to how to the New Testament, showing us, giving us examples, giving us warnings that we are to look out for. Kings chapter 12, verse 25 through 33, the golden calf. Before we get into this, just a little backdrop on the story. Um, you know, the children of Israel, they came, uh, uh, they came to the Red Sea out of bondage with Moses uh through the book of Joshua they take the land that God has given them the book of Judges goes through then you and then you have the book of Kings you have Saul was the first king of Israel then you have David the second king of Israel David sins so the proclamation goes forth to David that the kingdom is the kingdom is going to be split you know uh because of the sins with Bathsheba and the husband of Bathsheba Uriah David setting his life setting him up to be killed there were some consequences that had to be paid to their family and one of these consequences were that the kingdom was going to be split he wasn't going to take all the kingdom from David's lineage the same lineage that Christ was going to be born from but the kingdom was going to be split David had a son Solomon Solomon builds the temple Solomon goes on to have a son Rehoboam all this you'll find in first Kings uh, is 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 one thing we know so much about this society the society's music we know about the society's sports and so many things to learn but it's more important that we not neglect this book that we understand the history if you understand the history of this old testament and understand that this book is about one thing it's not about the law it's not about different different forms of religion it's not about uh Pile killed uh Mahildadesh but it's about Jesus Christ. If you can get that revelation that this book, everything about this book is about Jesus Christ. He is the holies of holy of holies. He is the ark of the covenant. He is the lamb that was slain and the blood that covered. covered. He is the wisdom. If you replace wisdom and Proverbs with Jesus, because the Bible says that Christ has made all of us, all Christ is wisdom unto all of us. This book is about Jesus Christ. It will come alive to you even in a greater detail. And so we have uh, Solomon. He builds the temple. He goes on. He has a son, Rehoboam. Well, at the time of Rehoboam's reign, the kingdom was split between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam received ten tribes to be the king over the northern kingdoms of Israel, whereas Rehoboam received two tribes. 
uh, and the southern kingdoms. And he and the capital of the southern kingdoms was Jerusalem. The capital of the northern kingdoms was Samaria. I know this may seem like some uh, a school lesson for some, but it's needed. And I'm trying to make it simple for all to understand because this is very important. This is if to understand this, these past truths, oftentimes God gives us revelations to our present condition and even the future. Christ, the spirit, the Christ, spirit of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And to understand what's going on in this Old Testament is to even understand your present and the future condition of the church, both now and what is to come. Now, as we get as as we as we uh, pick up with Jeroboam, he is taking over ten tribes of Israel, and we come to First Kings uh, chapter twelve, verse twenty-five. Then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Peniel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said, uh, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set one of them in Bethel and the other one in Dan. And this became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel in the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. This golden calf religion, this thing was made up by the king Jeroboam the king of Israel who wanted to keep to keep the kingdom unto itself for the selfish motive of drawing of drawing the people unto himself this king Jeroboam thought to himself well you know what I'll create a religion similar to the religion that God had ordained through Moses I'll put to a calf in Dan which is the northern part of Israel and in Bethel, which is the southern part, then I would tell the Israelites that these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. We are going to get into what did this what does this mean to us? The golden calf. This is more than just a hit the, the story of the golden calves holds deep spiritual truths. The Old Testament is a picture book illustration dealing with God's physical kingdom that foresees many aspects of God's spiritual kingdom. Jeroboam's religion was not just a historical events, but a warning and a, fore and a forewarning of an epic event to come upon the end time church. When Paul sees a falling away, I believe this is what Paul sees, this golden calf religion reborn, not in to the as a threat to the spiritual Jerusalem, the God spiritual church. Now, the first thing that we must note, as far as this golden calf religion is concerned, is the appearance of this religion. And in regards to Judaism, it was it was an exact replica. It wasn't Baalism. It wasn't Moloch. It wasn't the religion of the Egyptians. It wasn't the Asherah poles, but the Asherah poles that Israel worshipped. But it was an imposter of the real. First Kings twelve twenty eight. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you out of Egypt. Now, first, this was this would imply if it was a religion of the day, if it was a false calf of the day, of today, this would imply a fake Christ, a Christ formed out of the motives and the intellect of men. Now, the thought would be the thought to imply. This false calf, it was he whose blood covers you and saves you from the bondage of Egypt.
Now we're going to go over a couple of important aspects. Stay with me. Stay prayerful that God will open up your eyes of wisdom and revelations to see where we stand today. One, giving this God an image. Now we know by the second commandment is thou shalt not make an image of God. But these people broke the commandment specifically, having a God before God, not so much that it was before that particular God because it was an imposter of God, but it became an image. This image was an image of, an, of a calf, of an animal, which implies the changing of the attributes and the character of God. Now listen to it. Now, to re now God made us in his own image. We were to reflect his attributes and character, his spiritual attributes and character. So when you deal with image in the Bible, it's talking about the attributes and character, the personality, the motives and movements and thoughts of God himself. So to create in God, with a cre to create a God and give this God a visible image was to imply that you are changing or giving God attributes and a character. The image of a beast this golden calf, which what it was a beast or four-footed animal, given to it implies that God identifies with our beastly or our carnal nature. He identifies with this. The goal seems to glorify this nature. It's stated in Exodus 32. Now you have to understand that this is not the only place that the golden calf is mentioned. There's another place that, that this, this calf rears his head, which God gives a double... Uh, a, a, a double look at this at this thing so that we can contemplate exactly what it means to us we have the children of israel when they came across the red sea moses went up to the mountain for 40 days he was gone now in the absence of absence of moses the people wanted a god for themselves not that they were necessarily spiritual people but the innate the, the there's a calling a longing for people man naturally to long after a god to seek a essence or a force force higher than themselves now, this, so as Moses was going up in the mountain for 40 days, the people came to Aaron and told Aaron, where is this man, Moses? Give us a God. This is the account of the golden calf, of Aaron's golden calf. And, and this is Exodus chapter 32, starting with verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Make us gods which shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we what we what not has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are of the on the ears of your wives and sons and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it into a molten calf. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. These gods, the Nate, and as we pick up, so you see the second example, the two examples God gives in First Kings and in Exodus 32. These people, now we were left off talking about this gold glorifies the nature of man. It's in Exodus chapter 6, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and then rose up to play. You study this, rose up to play means they began to celebrate, they stripped off, the Bible tells us, they was dancing naked around this calf around this god who they claim to be a god these people could engage in a religious feast and offer sacrifices to god they can leave from a religious ceremony and then immediately rise up to a, indulge in lasciviousness and corruption this god would imply a salvation with no repentance that I can go to the place of worship. I can give offerings and sacrifices, sing the songs of praise, walk out the church doors, and then immediately continue in a lifestyle of corruption, lasciviousness, and ungodliness. The golden calf religion. Think about how this religion relates to the people around us and you yourselves in this day. We have to be warned. The church has to sound out the alarm. It's one thing to show people how we should be, how we are supposed to act in regards to God's law. But we also have to, to set out the alarm and what to watch out for. The alarm is one thing to show people how we should be, how we are supposed to act in regards to God's law. But we also have to, to set out the alarm and what to watch out for. 
the falseness and the, and the idolatry that is that is growing that, that will make its way into the church. We have to warn about this. So they will immediately they will immediately leave out and engage in lasciviousness and corruption. This God would imply that salvation with no repentance and 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 was would never this guy would not provoke a true change in the behavior and the character of his people they can go through the normal rituals of religion without manifesting the love and the character that comes from an intimate relationship with god now that's one aspect the first aspect of this calf will go over uh, uh more more the second aspect is that this aspect this calf this religion have multiple centers of worship as we see in our text in chapter in, in first kings chapter 12 that he said i will pit one in dan and one in bethel now there, there are many denominations and then he says israel it is too much for you to go way down in jerusalem you know it's too far there are many denominations of christianity now so that a believer could choose from a religious smorgasbord of beliefs Jeroboam wanted to shorten the distance to the place of worship so that people wouldn't have to take the strenuous journey to Jerusalem. Now, we can even relax in the comfort of our own home on Sunday and watch religious, religious programming rather than drive way across town to a church, to a church assembly. But I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, the shortening the distance to Jerusalem is a far more deeper spiritual truth than even that. Sins and behaviors that God will not accept nor tolerate are allowed in Jeroboam's religion. We will become more user friendly now. We don't want to tell people and call out their sins. We want people to leave good and in the good mood from church all the time. But sometimes we have to get down in that altar. Search our heart. Let our tears stain that altar. So that God can shape us and make us go to God with a broken and contrite spirit. It's not all about feeling good and rosy all the time. One will be quick to tell you that it doesn't take all of that. That amount of prayer, that church attendance, this kind of righteousness, that diligence, that way of dress, that's all exaggerated. This is a message echoing from those that sacrificed at Jeroboam's altar, that are sacrificing at Jeroboam's calf, shortening the distance. You don't need to do all of that. Why worry about the detail? The third aspect, one another aspect is we see that Aaron, you, the, the, he's he told the people to bring me your gold and he would give them a God. My goodness, listen to it. Bring me your gold and I will make you a God. You bring me your gold and I will make you a God that'll fit, that'll, that'll fit and accept your lifestyle. Now, when there is more of an emphasis on money than on holiness itself, you better watch out, child of God. I believe every believer should give, be a cheerful giver. Give a tithe? No, give more if you got it. But if I'm, but if I'm more concerned with your tithe than your righteousness, then I am a priest of Jeroboam. And you can mark that down and write it down. We have to be warned. God doesn't care about what you possess, but he cares what possesses you. God knows that a true Christian, you don't have to give a 10-minute dissertation about giving every Sunday because a true Christian born from the seed of God is going to give to the cause of God. Going to give to the cause of God. Whereas Jeroboam's religion lives off, lives off the money many times given to that assembly. Now we're going to move on. I'm not going to stay on that, stay in that area too long. But I'm going to move on the uh, the First Kings twelve thirty one. Another aspect: those that are allowed to minister at Jeroboam's altar, and he made priests from the lowest of the people that were not of the sons of Aaron. Mm. You know what? If you took some classes and you did learn the rituals, you, then you could be come a priest. Well, wow, can't you see the advertisement now? Take these easy classes and become a priest of Jeroboam. You'll be supplied with food and drink, a nice garb. You'll be respected among your peers. Oh, my goodness. That's not what God ordained. Your lineage did not even matter. Now you can become a priest. Anybody can become a priest. So the criteria for the priesthood no longer rested on the bloodline of the individual, which was ordained by God. The only the, the descendants of Aaron himself could become a priest but on the credentials and degrees that this man could produce and possess. 
Today I see many people that haven't been born again. That haven't been born into the heritage of Jesus Christ. They don't have that seed in them. I see a lot have a lot have a head knowledge and a theology that could. Uh, and I have seen even seen men with the Holy Spirit looked over for men looked over for men that could produce a degree for a position. But this has never been God's way. The apostles themselves were called ignorant and unlearned men in Acts chapter four verse thirteen. The criteria was not that the criteria alone was that they had been with Jesus, intimate time spent with Jesus. These days, people choose the clergy, the clergy position, like another job or any other job, and their motivation for preaching is something other than a love for Christ. See, see, those early apostles loved Christ. When Christ left, their world was crushed. An intimate relation spent, time spent with Christ, looking into his beautiful eyes. They would have went to the ends of the earth, of the world for Christ. And they proclaimed the message. And no board or association could change the message. Their message could not be watered down, for they had a message to proclaim. And they were sure that they were going to proclaim it. But. Now people go and, and the, the uh, to be a clerk is a job to some people and the message depends on the position. It, it, it has a hold on what they preach from that pulpit and the, and the and their position and power are a check influences what they say and many other truths that should be spoken prophetically from the pulpit going spoken. It's man's theology and, and intellect rather than thus saith the Lord all of God will raise up men and women that will one more time not even be not not be regarded for the amount of degrees that they had before the amount of prophetic utterances that they speak. That we can one more time get up in that pulpit and not talk about God, but men and women that are going to talk for God. They're going to speak with us. Thus saith the Lord from intimate time spent one on one with God sharing the heart of God. Modern day prophets. That's what we need in the pulpits today to turn us from the from the from the path that we're trekking down Jeroboam's golden calf religion and what we are left with is a system of religion that is far from Jerusalem it looks like it but it's not it and even the sacred gifts of God are misused or tossed to the side most folks don't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is anymore and those that have heard of it and those that have heard either feel that they don't need it, or even worse, have fallen victim to a false baptism with an imitation tongue along with the gifts of the Spirit. Men's psychology teach others what to say, but you will never find this in the Bible. Whereas those that receive never never received those that received the baptism in the Bible and spoke in tongues as a biblical evidence didn't even know what tongues were. Until it happened to them for the first time. But now folks will stand in front of you. Telling you just to let it out. Say what I say. Repeat it. Release it. Preparing psychologically a man just to spew some things out from his mouth. Being psychologically prepared by someone. <clears throat> I believe, that, I believe that if someone is seeking the baptism. We have no right to tell that man what to expect of that baptism. We ask him of their experience. Ask him of their experiences. What happened? Well, I felt good. I felt the inflow. Well, get back in there. You'll know it when you get it. Well, for me to tell you this is what's going to happen, you need to say it is, speak it, to imply, to let somebody just repeat what I said and then tell them that they got the baptism is a false prophet, ignorantly doing the wrong thing. Maybe some folks do it in ignorance, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you that in Cornelius' household, in the 10th chapter of Acts, those men and women had never even heard of speaking in tongues. They didn't know what it was. Even those Jews, when they seen them speaking in tongues and praising God, as the spirit fell, as the spirit fell, said to the peers, said to the other Jews present, "We might as well baptize those guys in water because they are receiving the spirit exactly like we did." On the day of Pentecost, as those hundred and twenty tarried in those in that upper room. And the sound of a mighty rushing wind came through, and tongues separated and and landed on each and every one of them and they spoke in tongues that the spirit gave utterance none of them were prepared Jesus didn't say when you begin to speak in tongues you will know that you have it he just said go and wait when you get it you'll know that you got it we must come back to the center we must get off the track on the way up to the to the, the golden calf of Dan 
we must bypass the one at Bethel, and we must make the long track, the strenuous journey on down to Jerusalem. We, we also must remember, this is one of the, of, of the main points, the last point that I'll make, that the majority, ten tribes worship at these golden calves. I'm sure there were some that said, hey, something ain't right. I'm going to bypass this. I'm going to go all the way down to Jerusalem. I'm going to go the whole way. Somebody told me that I pay too much attention to detail and they don't take all of that. Well, you better pay attention to detail. Brothers and sisters, our souls are at stake. The kingdom of God is real. And we must diligently seek to attain, to be worthy to attain that eternal life. The majority worship at the calf. I said the ten tribes to two. What is that saying of our day? Because it's big, don't make it right. But you better seek what thus saith the Lord in that word. We're not, uh, we're not to turn one iota from what is spoken in that word. See to it that you see to it that you make it according to the pattern that I showed you in the mount was the commission given to Moses when he was building that tabernacle. Christ is that tabernacle. We must see to it that we stay according to the pattern. There's no shortening of the distance. There's no choosing priests that are not of the lineage of Aaron. There's no give me your goal and I'll make you a God that fits your personality. There's no sitting down. There's no uh, sitting down to eat and drink in a feast to the Lord, going through religious rituals, and then rising up to play. It is sitting at the altar of God until we hear from heaven and go forth with a thus saith the Lord, allowing the Spirit of God to live, to move through us, to hear from Him. We are extensions of the God and Creator of this universe. I do what thus saith the Lord, and I only do what my God has me to do. In His presence is fullness of joy, and in His right hand are pleasures evermore. God is speaking to us in these last days for those that will hear it, for those that will go, for those that will go all the way, the golden calf religion of Jeroboam, the great falling away, the lying signs and wonders and miracles spoken about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 are upon us even tonight. Even tonight. Evaluate yourselves to make sure that the love of Christ, the love of God is in you you are walking in the footsteps of Christ himself that we are abiding by this this law by the gospel that was first given to us and preached by those holy prophets and apostles that all lost their life so that we may hear the truth beware of the lying signs and wonders men and women be are caught now, I believe that people can fall out under the power of the Holy Spirit but half of them if you don't put a catcher behind them they're not going to fall down then the ignorant ones out in the audience looking at them as if a power of God has been displayed because they feel they think because the one speaking or praying for them must exuberate some supernatural power because they made them fall out deceiving a lying sign a lying wonder tongues being repeated no, under not being spoken under the power of flesh not under the power of God deceiving those in the audience into thinking that some spiritual supernatural thing has been done I know this might make me unpopular with most but my intent is not to be popular with anybody, but to speak the truths of God. To stay and measure and engage everything I do and say by the word of this Bible. Not by a denomination, not by a man, not by a person, but by the word and by the spirit of God. The God's people, that those that are truly called to his will and purpose will be called out. Will be called out in these last day to be possessed of him and apprehend that which they were apprehended for. Come to him, children of God. Come to him. Be who you were supposed to be. Separate from this wicked and adulterous generation in these last days. The golden calf. The golden calf of Jeroboam. The golden calf of Aaron. The majority of religion. The replica. The duplication. There are many more prophecies and revelations that God wants to show us. But pray that God will open your eyes. Evaluate yourselves. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for those that are in leadership and authority over you. And you'll be all right. Trust God. Make any change possible. Rely not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, trust and acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. God bless you. May the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ be with you always. In his wonderful name. Amen.